thank you to the EBBF for, for having me and everyone who is able to be on the call today. Um, so my name is Mina Aslan. I live in Brooklyn, New York in the United States. Um, I am, I identify as a radical truth seeking change maker. And so a lot of my personal ethos is how can we inspire other change makers to truly make a uh, very impactful change uh, in for things that impact the environment, for things that impact human beings and human rights and civil rights. And also how do we use arts and culture as a vehicle for social change? And so for the past like almost three and a half years, I was working at the company Second Muse, uh, which really focused, it's an impact and innovation company that focuses on building ecosystems through social entrepreneurship in a variety of different industries or placemaking efforts. And so during my time at Second News, I was really privileged to be part of a program called Headstream, which was focused on building a, a new digital ecosystem around technologies that were designed with uh, really positive values uh, or like justice, equity, um, consciousness that was meant to empower youth well-being. And so what I had the privilege of doing was actually creating programs where young people were able to come in and be the protagonists of the building of this economy, whether that was in empowering their own entrepreneurial capacities or having them advise our, our entrepreneurs that were in the accelerator and so on and so forth. I've also advised on some projects that deal with plastic pollution reduction in Southeast and South Asia. And so I have a wide round of experience, but my main the takeaway that I hope you all remember about me is how important it is to actually center the communities of the world that we are trying to build. So very welcome, Mina. I really got um, uh, inspired by the fact that through your work, as you say, you are trying to inspire other change makers, right? Maybe can you define a little bit more what you mean with change makers uh, and actually how have you been inspiring them so far? Yeah, no, thank you so much. So I think that a lot of people identify change makers in a very different way but um i think in the in the climate of society that we live in right now it's there's a lot of things happening there's a lot of, of really scary things that are happening but there's also a lot of really positive things that are happening and for young people right now and like particularly i think people that are in their late 20s to like even the age of like 13 right now young people are already feel a deep sense of urgency and consciousness that we need to be part of like changing a lot of the problems that are happening, whether that's, oh, our environmental systems are creating pollution that is creating global warming. How do we build circular economies? Or like human beings are, are, are suffering, they're getting killed, there are bad things happening. How do we actually center their equity? How do we center justice? What What is justice? And so... so with all of that questioning, a lot of change makers leave uh, like secondary school, leave university, and then they go into the field and they end up becoming very disempowered in the workforce because, of course, social impact, social justice organizations are not immune to social forces. And so what does it mean to actually inspire young people is to give them a truth framework. People are very hungry for a North Star. I think when we think about truth, it starts with understanding the purpose of human existence. And so pretty much all uh, religious doctrines, pretty much all the greatest philosophers on earth can come to some sort of agreement that the purpose of human existence is that we were created noble. We were created to be good. And if you look at our social and economic systems right now, they are all founded on this belief that human beings are greedy, that human beings are self-rationally interested, and that's perpetuated in our social and economic systems. But if we turn that rationale on its head and we start developing systems based off of human nobility, you then perpetuate love, you perpetuate justice, mercy, compassion, so on and so forth. And so when it comes to inspiring young people as change makers today, 
one of the biggest things is just demystifying the reality of our worlds, understanding how, how do processes and systems happen? What does the business world really look like? Technical expertise about the, the systems that impact them, who has what kind of leverage, demystifying that and being authentic and transparent with people allows them to feel empowered to insert their lived experiences, understanding that, oh, actually, like all of these things about the system isn't it. I've lived through that. It's not as nuanced. It's not as complicated as I thought. And then it empowers them to to speak up and be brave and courageous and participate in that change making. I think also creating communities, especially for very interdisciplinary communities of change makers, whether they are from a small town in the United States, or they are from a big city in Africa, or they are from wherever they are in certain parts of the world. I think creating an interconnected uh, global community where you can, where people can meet each other where they are at um, is really important for this idea of change making. And I think the last point uh, to to your question, Martina, is that in a lot of our cultures, in a lot of our uh, ethnic cultures, social cultures, um, there's this idea that even if you choose to be a change maker, that there is a structured path that you should take. So many like change makers, they're like, oh, I want to be a lawyer or I need to be an engineer. Or, I need to have these type of accolades to, to, to make change. And they think about what type of profession they want to have. They're like, I want to be, you know, I, I don't know. Like they, they think I want to be a business person. I want to be a lawyer in this way. I think we need to move from like a profession uh, centered work life. And we need to move to an impact center work life and a purpose centered work life. So thinking about more, what is the impact that I want to have in the world? What is uh, what is it that I want to do in the minutia and the day to day? That and then if it was its its highest, its loftiest form, is what my impact is on society, my small dent in building this better world. And I think when you really commit to that, it burns away any societal norms or expectations. It cultivates courage and bravery to do the right thing. It cultivates really meaningful careers where you're not thinking anymore just about like, how much money I will make, or am I, you know, like this job makes sense, but you're actually designing your own life's career based off of your purpose. And that allows you to also reflect on, on your God-given qualities and, and all of these beautiful things. So I think those are some ways of like thinking about empowering change makers or like, I guess the ethos of empowering change makers and I think the very simple answer of how have I done that is creating opportunities and spaces where you demystify knowledge, you create community, and you have people focus on their purpose and, and not get lost in the noise of society. And how would you define those spaces as uh, places where people can gather and talk and, uh, and share ideas and, and maybe yeah. create programs themselves? Yeah. Yeah, so I think like, for example, in the case of Second Muse, um, our one of our programs for Head Street, which focused on youth well-being, um, it happened at the beginning of the global pandemic for COVID. And so quickly, we had to learn how to create online communities instead of in-person communities. And so what we ended up doing was we created a, a program. It was called Youth to Innovator Programs. And we basically did outreach on Instagram, on TikTok, on all these places where these young people are already at. And I think that sentiment is true for actually any demographic. Meet them where they are at. Don't, you know, just try to make them come to you. So we met these young people where they were at. And we basically, similar to what you all are doing, we created um, like Zoom calls or we created um, platforms like Slack or like, like Geneva where there, or Discord, which is these like online platforms where people can engage and talk. And so I think 
myself and my team were able to really lead by example and being very authentic and saying like, hey, the world is in a scary place right now. But we also had an assurance that like we have a responsibility to do good. And I think that made young people with that particular demographic feel safe and trust us. And so then they would be in these spaces talking and and participating. And so that built trust. And then when we wanted to teach them things about like entrepreneurial skills, and it's like, okay, like you have an idea of like technology that should be created. This is, this is important. You should make this, but you don't have the skill set. Now you trust us. Let's learn your learning style. And so now we got to actually learn that these these people learn in really different ways and we would create programming and design facilitated spaces in really unique ways. So we got to like the, in the practical ways, like we even got to do activities like world building, which I'm not sure if people are used to that or familiar with that design practice, but it's a method that is used in filmmaking, video game making, so on and so forth of like designing and creating a world, like a a world that is like almost like a fantasy land. But people have started using that design framework of designing the vision of what does like a new world structure and order look like that upholds human prosperity. And so we would do that with the young people. And they would get so excited and empowered and it gave them hope and not even a a blind hope, a practical hope that, you know, that they are part of a change and that they, they can be if they look inside themselves and if they are honest and truthful about their, the, the reality of their human existence. Um, and so, yeah, those are some practical ways that I think in the COVID context, it was really online, but you know, thank God that we are able to have in-person spaces like the EBBF conference that's coming up in May. Um, you know, there's now opportunities to do a lot of that in person, which people are really hungry for. When I hear you, I really feel you're creating such a good foundation for youth before they enter the, the business, the corporates or whatever world, uh, uh, work uh, world. Uh, so you are accompany them in this uh, uh, phase. I wonder how you prepare them to the shock of entering an organization that very often does not support this mindset, sometimes not even the values, you know? And this is, as you were saying, there is such a clash, such a frustration at the beginning of a career, you know? And it's so easy to lose the hope of having a meaningful career. Because with program like yours, you really get empowered, you really get motivated, inspired, you really want to change the world. And then very often, unfortunately, we find ourselves in a contest where we don't have the tools or we are not uh, uh, supported in this uh, social change that you are talking about. So do, do you, how do you prepare them for this uh, shock? And if you keep also supporting them in the process, uh, so a couple of things I want to bring that point up, like really again about like demystifying knowledge. I think oftentimes we underestimate the capacity of young people. And I think also, so I think there's a little bit of underestimating the capacities of young people, but also I think in the way professional culture exists, we are not blunt. We are not transparent. We are not authentic. We are taught the opposite. We are taught that we must be like rigid in many ways. We are taught that we actually have to hide a lot of the most beautiful parts of ourselves. And so I think because of that, there is sometimes a veil of truth of what like the negative aspects or even the positive aspects of like the work life truly is in an organization. So I think creating more opportunities where you demystify the knowledge of the process of a business. So for example, I think many of us can agree that the happiness of your life is highly dependent on how wonderful your manager or boss is. Um, And that is a concept that we really only learn from experience. But it is something that can be taught when you understand how a structure of a bureaucracy especially a bureaucracy works, you'd show that to young people, you teach young people, even meet them where they're at. 
in colleges, making media that shows stories that kind of explain some of those dynamics, um, making, uh, you know, that could even be social media, that could be like even television shows, giving window into the world of work life. And not even just the work life itself, but what does the decision making of like leaders of a company even really look like? Because that helps people, especially young people, understand how change functions. Because at the end of the day, you may be like a manager, you may be an entry level employee at a, a company or at an organization, but once you learn how large decisions get made and, oh, there's actually a board of directors and they have a really large hand in making decisions. And actually like this person has no leverage whatsoever, or your manager only has, uh, you know, leverage over certain aspects of your life. And so when you begin to understand how that system of the work life works, coupled with really like that North star of commit to truth, commit to building that that those systems based off of human nobility knowing that we are inherently good that is our goal that's where we're working towards being steadfast on that journey allows you to be courageous in the workplace it allows you to speak up when you can it also it forces you to practice tact and so through mentorship through spaces of collaboration also sometimes through just lived experiences that can maybe happen young at, at a younger age um, are all opportunities that that shock factor can be eliminated and just I want to I mentioned this like in this little speech I gave but I really want to hone in the point that right now nothing influences the masses more than media particularly television and so like we see shows kind of like uh there's a very popular american um network television show now called abbott elementary if you haven't heard of it uh try to you know check it out on youtube or uh on daytime or on nighttime tv um but it's a show that gives window into the life of teachers in a public school education system in Philadelphia. And so it really, in a very humorous way, brings to light a lot of injustices and inequities. And it helps people understand the public education system in a way that they wouldn't have unless they directly experienced it. And so creating more media like that, where young people who are not even just young people, but people in general who are really enthusiastic to make change need to understand the system and also like their experiences and what really happens when you move in certain ways. Having media that is created that tells the stories of change makers is imperative to eliminating any shock feelings about going into the workforce and kind of feeling like you're between realms, like you're kind of part of this like dying old world structure of society, but you're also really committed to building a new, like we're just kind of between realms in a way and taking comfort in that identity and knowing that it's a dance. I'm, as I wrote, I'm really struck by just how clear you are about your purpose, your direction is like rock solid, no worries. It's very different from most of the conversations that I have with people about meaningful careers. So my question is twofold. One, how do you develop that clarity? So I guess you were not born clear. So somehow this was developed. And the second thing you mentioned a lot about knowledge, having knowledge of, what are your frameworks for obtaining knowledge? What are some of your sources of knowledge to also build that clarity? So the first one, uh, I'm going to share a little bit of my personal story. So I, um, I am 26 years old. I graduated, I went to college um, back in, I started college in 2014. And I went to uh, a school in the United States called UC Berkeley. And uh, Berkeley is a, a very tough, very competitive school. Um, it's also a school that is very well known for its history in the civil rights movement. And so I was very excited to go there for that reason. And what I realized was that with time when I was, you know, going to classes and whatnot, uh, a lot of my my personal education at, at such an elite university started to become more 
um, about like, okay, let me just like, let me just get the grade and I need this to graduate so I can go become a human rights lawyer because that's what I'm going to need to do to, to change the world and, and be like a mall Clooney and help all these countries and, and, you know, and so on and so forth. And then I felt very jaded. And so I have a little bit of an unconventional path where I started not going to class. And instead I would sign up for international youth conferences that talked about the, the sustainable development goals. And so I was able to go to Tashkent, Uzbekistan. I went to uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. I went to Tetuan, Morocco. I went to all these different places in different parts of the world for these conferences where I was actually able to learn on the ground. And I, I, it was in that moment that I really felt like I was going through the motions. I, I come from an Iranian background, which I love being Iranian, but one of the, the areas of Middle Eastern culture is sometimes like when we come to a new country, like there is a need to, to survive and have a path of stability. And so sometimes it's like, oh, well, you know, if I want to change the world, you know, a lawyer is a path of stability. And I realized I was like, I actually don't think that the field of law is is going to, you know, do what I want to do. And then I started asking myself, what do I want to do? And so I actually dropped out of college for about a year and I was working at a very small Persian market that was close to my school. And I didn't tell anybody. And I was just, it was during that time I was reading a lot. I love to read. I was reading the Quran. I was reading a lot of the Baha'i writings. I was reading a, the Bible. I was reading a lot of some of my favorite scholars like Bell Hooks, uh, James Baldwin, Tori Morrison. Like there's all these amazing bodies of work that I knew, I knew that I wanted to alleviate injustice. And it was only then I realized when I was going to those spaces around the world that I genuinely didn't know what I wanted to do. And so through all these history books I started reading, I really pinpointed that, okay, I want to live in a world that there's no racism, the economic exploitation that comes from imperialism and colonization is gone, that we are bounded by unity, but we're also not conformists, that we are vibrant, that we are joyful. So I started pinpointing that the cause of a lot of the world's evils came really down to a spiritual like lie, a lie about our existence. And that lie is that, you know, capitalist structures, even the way that like communism was practiced, it ended up being founded on an idea called homo economicus, the idea that the economic man, the way that human beings were created, it was to be ever consuming because we are greedy, because that's, that is our nature. And so when everything is built upon that nature it becomes exploitative. So I kind of just was on this journey of like really learning. And when I realized that I was like, what I want to do, whatever career it might be, it's going to be building these new systems off of human nobility, the fact that human beings are created noble. And so by the grace of God, I ended up going back to school. I finished because I was, I was like, I know what I want to do. I know. And even to this day, I, I feel this conviction to the bottom of my soul. And I, I went back, I finished and I started Googling. I started Googling like, oh, like, you know, like how, how do you change economic systems? Like I did, I was not looking up careers and actually my dear friend, Andrea, who is on this call, um, told me about the company Second Muse and that is trying to change these, you know, build these new economic systems. And so that's when, you know, I started becoming exposed to that whole world of open innovation, using social entrepreneurship for good, building ecosystems, economy building. And so because I was, I'm committed to that North star from that experience, all of my social norms and expectations of myself that from family, from culture, just burned away. My commitment is like to whatever God wants me to do. And I'm using, you know, I'm trying to use my brain to, to get there. Um, so I think for me, like that's how I developed clarity. It was by being brave enough to be really truthful, truthful enough to analyze history correctly, truthful enough to envision the future that we should live in, truthful enough to realize what was holding me back and, and committed to this ever evolving truth framework 
is what allows me to refine my clarity as tests come into my life. And then, um, can you repeat your second question, Daniel? It was about knowledge. Huh? You mentioned that you're preparing young people for knowledge. I think it's two things. What are your knowledge frameworks for building that knowledge? And what yes. are your sources of knowledge? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so I live in the United States, right? Which is a very secular country to a point where it's sometimes really taboo to talk about spiritual concepts and spiritual, you know, religion. And I think that, um, I think when we talk about religion in a very dogmatic way, it can be very harmful. But when you talk about spiritual principles very authentically from the lens of your own life and from a place of constant learning, like collective learning and an invitation to learn with others, you should never, ever be anything short of confident of bringing those up. So my commitment is like, I talk about spiritual concepts to literally everybody and anybody I need, meet. It doesn't have to be in the name of the Baha'i faith. It doesn't have to be in the name of Islam or Christianity, but it's the essence of what I believe is truth. And so I gain a lot of my knowledge frameworks from truths I've learned from the Baha'i writings that are just permeated into my entire DNA. There are also truths that I've learned from Islam. There are truths I have learned from the Bible. There are there are things that I have learned also from outside of spiritual and religious beliefs. I There's a lot of, you know, one of my favorite, favorite scholars, if you haven't, um, you know, read any of her books, I highly recommend it, Bell Hooks. Um, you know, she is a, what she calls a practitioner of love, but her whole ethos is um, really studying feminism from like this intersectional framework of different types of experiences, having that crossover. Um, and she uses a spiritual mindset or like what I would call a spiritual mindset. And she talks about like a love ethic. And so that love ethic is very different or like the name of it is different than a spiritual, you know, what I call a spiritual framework or a truth framework. But it, in practice, it is the same thing. It is the same thing. And so I'm able to then experience other, you know, philosophers and then learn about history from their lens. And so like, it, it really helps uh, refine that framework. I also, I, I really want to say that a lot of the the histories, the philosophies, uh, the scholarship of, of Black women from the United States, of uh, Latino women, of really prominent the change makers in that way, I think has been very imperative to my building of knowledge because when you listen to the the knowledge of the people who are the most oppressed in society, you are able to see the most clearly because it, it then includes everybody because you're focusing on the the most vulnerable. So those are some areas of like a knowledge framework that um that has personally impacted me thank you mina yeah go ahead stevie hi mina i love what you're talking about this is awesome i'm trying to kind of formulate what the question is i'm trying to ask so you might be able to help me along with this too or anyone else um i'm a solopreneur and so and and very much sharing these same values i am a baha'i as well and um, trying to uh, formulate the talents and and understanding and experience and knowledge that I have and bring that to the world, uh, specifically through branding. And um, what I've noticed so far in my very young career is um, a lot of businesses I try and interact with and, and CEOs and C-suites and all of that kind of stuff don't necessarily share the same values that I share. And so don't actually see the value often of what it is that I might be trying to bring to the table. Um, so then my, you know, in, in this search for, for clients and things like that, um, I, I tend to be really narrowed down. Um, and, and as this landscape maybe is currently changing, I'm hopeful that it is. Um, but the, the, the values just haven't really matched up yet. So, um, I'm just curious what type of, um, advice might you have for, and maybe advice that you guys have been giving to young um, 
wanting to be entrepreneurs, maybe not individuals who want to just jump into some type of corporation or anything, but really have a type of talent or or a, a vision in, in their mind of what they might want to be able to bring to the table. First of all, I want to honor that branding is one of the most important things that is needed right now because branding is the creation of the identity of a business. It is the entire, it is the being, it's not just what you see, it's what you are. And so I think that a lot of businesses don't know their identity. And so for, for people like us that have this truth framework and really like a lot of conviction in, in your beliefs, we understand that even a business is made up the identity of humans uh, that are creative noble. And so oftentimes, I actually would say that it is more beneficial to have clients that do not have a social impact lens than to work with those who do. And I would actually urge people to make, like, of course, work with those who already have that lens. I think there's generally a spectrum. I think there's people that are one extreme that are just like, you know, really vile beliefs. And then there's another extreme of people where it's like, oh, you, you got this. In the like 25 to 75% in that like spectrum, there are people who don't know their identity and they don't know really what they're doing. And especially in this society, like you cannot ignore social ills anymore. Like you cannot. And so if you, my advice is to be very confident that one of your skill sets, not just like your personal beliefs, but your skill set is extracting the true identity of your business so that it touches the hearts and minds of the people that you are trying to impact. And in turn, even like this isn't even the intention, but it is a it is an absolute byproduct of that framework. Those people will profit off of it. Like whatever that business is, you will make more money when your branding and the identity of a business is actually able to touch the minds and the hearts of people. And so I guess my advice would be like, and, and I'm I'm kind of now a solopreneur. I've recently left Second Muse to, to start my own thing. Um, I love them so much. They were like my first family, my first like business family. Um, but I would say that if there is a, if you're looking for clients, like frame like a value-driven branding approach to the people that don't have like a social impact lens. And then if there are people that have a social impact lens, you bring the branding skill set with that like value driven branding, but with a really high technical expertise of that process. Because sometimes social impact people, they're so heartfelt and loving, but sometimes they miss the like, okay, you still got to present well and you, you know, all that stuff. So I actually think giving opposites attract here can be in your favor thank you mina and I, I just want to connect with that to your transition at this point right so a few weeks ago you left the second news and from what we are hearing now and, and today you were having a meaningful career right indeed but yeah, then you I'm had a, new... a meaningful career it, yeah it, I want to say it, meaningful <laughs> doesn't mean it's easy <laughs> it's not no easy, that, that but... that's definitely not but but we have seen uh, also throughout different webinars that very often people find uh, uh, the energy to make a career shift when things are not going right, right? When when they are not having a meaningful career, so they are still seeking uh, to find their purpose. In your case, very young, uh, very ambitious, already having a career uh, which we can define meaningful. What was that intuition, that trigger, that motivation that pushed you? Uh, to go outside of your comfort zone in a way as well and to keep searching for an even more meaningful career. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I think, um, of course, like a meaningful career is not void of a lot of the things that dull a career. Like uh, I am not immune to being overworked or like working long hours and having 
poor communication with a team or having a bad, like a, like a difficult situation with a manager, possibly like I'm not immune to those things. The world of social change organizations and, and careers are not immune to those problems. Um, and so I think for me, one like navigating through those things, I, I, I had to again recalibrate and and realize that like my my purpose and my vision is very clear but I grew like I learned a lot at my time at Second Muse and I grew and it came to a point where what I was doing like th there was more that could be done that like that organization is just not in certain fields so like I, I will give an example so when I was working on these programs, uh, for a very, a very prominent client. Um, we, I, well, we started realizing that a lot of their decision-making about where large sums of funding would go started to become dependent on cultural climate. And so, for example, in the United States, um, in 2020, there was a large surge of the black lives matter movement when George Floyd was murdered. And so once that happened, a lot of funding, which is a very positive thing, a lot of funding started moving towards very intentional racial justice work. And so that's one example. But we started seeing a lot of trends like that, and particularly how much uh, those trends would impact both the masses and funders. And so the bridge that I kind of got, the gap that I bridged in my mind was this idea of to influence where money flows, you must also influence culture. To influence culture, you influence the masses. To influence masses, you have to meet them where they're at. And so in my case, it's media. So like film and TV, social media, so on and so forth. And so creating like content that is like really meaningful, but not cheesy. And it's very authentic. And it also teaches without trying to directly teach um, actually is really what the world is, is hungry for. It's one of the many things that is really necessary in the world right now um, to really move the masses towards moral consciousness. And so I was not working at a media company, but I also, I don't want to just be, I don't want to be a, a filmmaker alone. I also am always going to be a change maker. So to me, I was like, oh, like I, I really want to do stuff in this intersection of like arts and culture and all like environmental justice, human rights, but we also need to do storytelling and, you know, we need to do all these things. And at a certain point I was like, I've learned like what I needed to learn here. I listened to my intuition and there's a lot of love that I had from, you know, this beautiful organization. And now it's like, okay, it's like, it's time to believe in yourself. Believing in yourself is not easy. And it's definitely not, um, it, it's expensive <laughs> to believe in yourself as an entrepreneur. But I had a lot of faith. And I think that a quality of really strong entrepreneurship, that is a spiritual quality that is not talked about often it rolled two things is discernment and intuition. And those are spiritual phenomena that we are not taught to refine. And so when you listen to the little truth voice in your mind, that it's like, this is not easy necessarily, but it's time to choose, like to do something different, listening to that voice, making decisions off of it, it refines it. And then confirmations come. The second I left, I got like, I got a, I got a gig. Like I, it just happened like two days after and I prayed for it and it came and, you know, I'm like trying to still like, you know, get more of those opportunities, but it's just to show that confirmations come when you listen to, to your intuition like that. So that's how I knew. Right. Sometimes we do forget to listen to our body, right? And to, uh, to the intuition. So uh, Daniel was asking. You started your gig. So you're starting your thing, your business, your thing. So, okay, now I'm starting. I'm really excited. Okay. Where do you start? It's very different to work for something, for an organization. Now it's your thing. So where do you put the priorities? My first three things to do would be this, that, and the other. And why would those three things or whatever be the first thing you start from? Very practically, I think the first thing that I, I did or like I'm doing 
is um, I created a theory of change. Like it's almost like my life's theory of change. And I'm not sure, not everyone is maybe familiar with theories of change, but for those who aren't, a theory of change is, it is exactly what it sounds. It's your theory of the social change that your business or your organization or your enterprise is trying to make. And so you're proving that theory through a visual framework. And so clearly from this talk that you've all been sitting through for this long, I, I have a lot of ideas about, you know, what that change needs to be. And so it was just putting that on paper, giving it cohesion and refining it was my first step because that is like, that is going to be the framework that it's like going to always evolve, but it's the underlying thing of the business. Next being, you know, I'm sometimes I live in the clouds, but I also live in the, the minutia and the micro. And I think you have to be able to, to bridge between the two. And so for me, it was being really clear with where I want to start. And so the, like the, sometimes I'm so interdisciplinary and multi hyphenate that I'm like, how do I explain this to people? How do I pick one? Or there's so many lofty spiritual concepts behind what I'm trying to say. Like, I don't want it to be diminished or minimized, but I was like, nope, you have that vision, leave her there. And then I started refining. I was like, okay, practically it's that like the buckets I will work in. It's like, I will do environmental justice work, human rights, civil rights work, arts and culture, social change work. Those are the three buckets. There may be things that are fluid among the three that, you know, it's fine, but that's how I organize like some the pursuits of the type of work I want to do. And then also being very clear about like, okay, film and media making is an area that I need to grow. These are all the passion projects that I want to have setting goals and deadlines. Are like, this is the type of expertise I need to cultivate to make this, this, and that. So really practically kind of defining those like immediate steps. And then I think the last, like most important third step, which Stevie, you're well familiar with this, was that I really created my like business identity and brand or, or at least the initial phases. Of course, it's going to iterate, but like, for example, my LLC, which is just, you know, it's the vehicle that I get to do some of these consulting projects. It is called Between Realms. And like, as I mentioned that title earlier, like I identify as a child of the half light. Like I'm watching an old world die and I still have to live in it. I have to pay my bills and do taxes, but then I also am trying to build this new world and I can see glimmerings of it being made. And so I just, I constantly feel like I'm living between the material and the spiritual, the old and the new, the East and the West. And so that is core to my identity. That name is core to my identity. And then connecting that with the work that I do, I like started to build a brand and even the, the joy of like building a color palette of the business is rooted in the identity. Um, and so from there, I'm like, okay, now I have templated decks, materials that all rep kind of visually represent the ethos of the change I'm trying to make in the world. Let me make a pitch deck. Let me make a one pager. Let me do this. Now it's systematized. There's a process there that I don't have to redo it from scratch every single time. It's like, okay, now it's like, go, go network, like talk to people. Like you want to make this change, like, you know, go. So those are like the three steps. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mina. We are getting at the end of this, uh, of this gathering. Any additional question from anyone? Oh yes, um, it's really, really nice to to learn from your experience. But I think you have right to build to to get the experience to build bridges to from one side to the other side to get more experience and to learn. And I I think it's really really great. I I don't have a question, but I had an observation that everything you said resonated with me. I am just impressed with how dynamic you are and how clear you are. I am positive that the Baha'i inspiration 
is uh, helping you with your North Star. It's definitely helping me with my North Star in my job. I'm a director of human resources and I'm always looking to ways to mentor people, especially Gen Y and Z. And I really appreciated uh, your thoughts on that. Sometimes it's hard to get them engaged. And a question I had, sorry to get it so detailed. You said many young people understand and are engaged. Unfortunately, in my sphere and realm, whether at work or personal life, I'm feeling like a lot of young people who should be engaged are not voting, are not stepping up, and somehow are lost in this other world that you were talking about, the one that's folding, uh, rather than the one we want to strive for. So how do you um, recommend that I poke and prod them in a very gentle, diplomatic way to be active, to be part of the solution? Yeah, that is a great question, Susan. Thank you so much. Also, thank you for your your kind words. Um, I want to I want to say that like yeah, I think yes, I do strongly believe that there are a lot of very engaged, dynamic, excited, empowered Gen Z that just need direction. I do completely recognize that there's a like just everywhere in our society, it's really polarized. So it's also in the opposite where there are youth who are incredibly jaded and like young people. That's just like, no, like there's no accountability. There's no sense of responsibility. There's a complete sense of hopelessness. Like the negative other end is very also in existence. And I thought like, um, it sounds almost silly, but from those young people that I've worked with, like, from literally like 14 to like 30, I think what they need most is something to be excited about. And a lot of the things that excite them are very transient things. Like it's things like, especially for like a really younger demographic, it's like, or maybe an older demographic of youth. It's like, I just want to go like have drinks with my friends or for like a really younger generation. It's like, I just, you know, I want to get somebody that I like to like my Instagram post. Like it's, it's these things that it's like in external validations or it's like in numbing practices. Um, and so of course, like if we believe that like people, I fundamentally believe that people are excited and healthier when they have purpose like even if it is the smallest most meaningful purpose so in especially as a director of human resources knowing the organization that you are in wherever you can find areas to spark excitement that is rooted in genuine purpose and push little opportunities towards that that also make people feel supported I think like that is the gentle nudge finding or creating those sparks of excitement, but not the numbing way, not the old world order way, but really rooted in, in something like meaningful. And that excitement, that ability to feel something has really been lost. And so like people just need to feel something. And so creating that, I think would be really impactful. So Michael is asking uh, via chat, uh... Uh, how do you ask the question to find the right solution? So the first question of like, how do you um, ask the questions to find the right solutions is I, I like to bring things back down to just virtues, just virtues, not complex concepts, anything, just the virtues. And so I think a lot about in the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah says that trustworthiness is the virtue that will allow for all like security and, and, and prosperity of the world. So like we know how important trustworthiness is. And so I, I think about like moments where, you know, if I'm seeing like a problem in, in something, if I, re if I'm seeing like, like there's an issue of like, somebody feels insecure or there's instability and then there's projections coming from that. I'll try to ask like, what is that missing virtue? And I'm like, oh, it's trustworthiness. And so it's like, okay, how do you build genuine trust? 
especially when people are like a little bit in competition with each other and there's egos at play. How do you make everybody feel like, you know, boats are afloat? And so I think I try to ask questions from just a singular focal point of finding like the missing virtue, or just sometimes you can see it really clearly, like, oh, there's really a, like love missing here. Um, there's justice missing here. There's compassion missing here. So I think that's that's my um, way of trying to really formulate the important questions. I'm also a big believer that a the, the right question is more important than the right solution. So I think that, so is there a key question that you always ask to quickly find the solution? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> um, I don't have one, but I do. I think in general, like I'm like holding the rope of truth and like really interrogating, like, is this is is this true or like is this manifesting truth or is this concealing truth? And so having truth as like your guidepost for everything forces you to, to really be like brave and courageous and ask tough questions. And so I think just the openness to ask tough questions and not being afraid of those answers and then keep going is probably my like mode of operation. Um, and which value is at the top of your list? Truth, truthfulness. Truthfulness is the top of my list. It's the, it's the foundation of literally everything. So yeah, that that's, I hope that answered your question, Michael. Thank you very so, much. So much knowledge and inspiration. Thank you so much, Mina. That's Thank been you so excellent much. and really inspiring listening to you today. Thank you so much, Martina, for having me, for hosting me. 